Hello, everyone, and welcome to this YRL session that we're so excited about called Spring Clean O Rama. Although I don't know if uh, the weather was cold and frosty where you are in Alberta, but here in Edmonton, where I'm sitting, we had a ton of snow and it does not feel like spring at all. So that's too bad. We have lots of people from all over the region joining us today here for the webinar. Welcome, we are so excited to have you all here. Um, a couple of housekeeping items before we get started with all of this. Um, you should have access to uh, questions. So feel free to ask questions throughout the session or if you're having any kind of technical difficulty or needing support in that way, um, make sure that you use the question box to um, to ask and one of us will get, get back to you for sure. And if it's a question that um, uh, is worth sharing with the rest of the group, well, they're all, they're all worth sharing, but like a non-technical question or whatever, um, we'll be sure to read that out and share it. Um, everyone's mics are muted and your cameras are off right now. So you can just sit back and relax and listen to us uh, talk about spring cleaning. Um, uh, and this, this session is also being recorded right now as well. So um, we're recording it and we'll have it up on our Niche Academy. So if there is useful information for you um, uh, or you want to share with your staff, uh, feel free to do that. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce myself. I know lots of you, um, uh, but my name is Jessica Nock. I am a uh, librarian um, in the Library Development Services area of uh, YRL and I have my colleagues here with me Andrew and Stephanie and I'm going to let each of you introduce yourselves before we get started. Okay um, my name is uh, Andrew Nierenhausen and I work in technology services here at Yellowhead Regional Library. Awesome and thank I you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm Stephanie Darrow you may know me as the manager of technology services. Great. Uh, we're going to start with Andrew, who's going to talk about um, uh, spring cleaning your website and all the little tidying that can happen on your website. Stephanie is going to talk about digital decluttering, and I'm going to be talking about a topic near and dear to my heart, and that's actually tidying your physical spaces. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn off my camera and my mic and turn things over to Andrew to get things started. Okay, thank you very much. So my name's Andrew. Um, and today I want to talk a bit about spring cleaning for your website. Um, if you notice that my um, webcam is flickering, just a note that that's on my end and not on your end, so not to worry about that. Um, so Stephanie, if you want to move me to the next slide. So spring cleaning, um, something that we do for our homes, uh, we do for our workplaces, we clean out our sheds, closets, cars, so why not our websites? Uh, after a full year of adding information, documents, images, uh, we can end up with a lot of extra stuff on our websites. Uh, and a lot of this stuff we're not even using anymore. So this stuff is it's gonna slow down our website, um, but it's also gonna make it harder to find the information that we're actually looking for. So today we're gonna to take a look at uh, some ways to keep the information on your website organized, um, which will also in turn uh, make things pretty easy to clean up. And by the end of the session, you should be comfortable going onto your site and doing a bit of your own spring cleaning. Uh, and next slide, please. So today we're gonna to look at a few examples um, of some useful ways to think about organizing your website. Uh, I'm also gonna focus mainly on the media library side of Sitecore, um, because this is where the majority of files uh, are gonna be uploaded and stored on your site, um, and where you're probably gonna have the most congestion of files. <clears throat> so the most important aspect um, of managing our websites is organization, uh, especially if there are multiple people using the website. Um, we want to make sure that all of the users have the same understanding of how things are laid out. And this helps when it comes time to clean uh, because we won't have to spend as much time searching through files uh, and we know what we're looking at. Uh, next slide, please. 
so there's two main points uh, about organization that I want to cover today. Um, and we're going to go through both of them in a bit more detail, uh, but they are folder organization and naming conventions. So starting with folder organization, um, there's a lot of good ways that you can have your folders organized. Um, but I'm going to share a few ideas that work well in Sitecore and are things that I, I do regularly see uh, on our YRL sites. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing that I would recommend uh, would be to create uh, a separate folder for images and documents. Uh, and by documents, I generally mean PDFs. Uh, so both images and documents get stored in the media library uh, of Sitecore. Um, but they both behave differently on your website. Um, then in each of these folders, you would want to have mo more folders based on uh, content, topics, break it up that way. So if we look at this, um, this demo folder here, we can see what this looks like. Um, so under documents, we have board documents and calendars. Um, and these are likely to be PDF files. Uh, board documents are often things like um, minutes or proposals, uh, things like that. And then under images, we have what would be probably your carousel banners, uh, event posters, JPEGs, other files like that that you would use for events. So obviously, this isn't a perfect system. Um, you may want to attach some documents to your events. Uh, or maybe you want to create uh, a calendar as a JPEG file um, and put that on a specific page. Uh, next slide, please. So you could reverse this idea um, and you can have several topic folders uh, and then separate them again by media type. So if we look at this demo folder, uh, we see a bit of a different structure. Uh, and here we have uh, board information, which again is mostly going to be um, documents or PDFs. Um, we have logos and banners, which are likely to be uh, images. Um, but for programs and events, you may have both. So this is a bit of a hybrid structure. Um, in this calendars folder, you could have PDF or JPEG. Um, but this, this is a, a useful way to break it up. So the best structure is going to be the one that works for you and your library. Um, both of these ideas that I showed you are, again, based on the kinds of things that I do see regularly on YRL member libraries. Um, but you are the best judge of what works for you. So that's file structures. Um, and now let's talk a little bit about naming conventions. Uh, next slide, please. So when I talk about naming conventions, uh, I should stress that um, you don't need to follow these conventions to the T. Um, I think what's more important is having some consistent components um, to your naming. So for example, you might always have uh, an element of time, like the month or the year uh, in the file name. Um, or maybe you uh, number your documents in sequential order. Um, although we'll see uh, in this next example that there are some times drawbacks to sequential ordering. So when we look at an example uh, like these images here, uh, we have two files named Capture and Capture2. So at first glance, uh, it's hard to tell if these are the same file or if there's anything different about them. Uh, and if you're just scrolling through the back end of your website, you might not be able to tell. Uh, next slide, please. But if we were to scroll down in Sitecore, um, we would see that the images are slightly different sizes. So this is going to be a little confusing if you want to use these images again, um, if you want to make sure you're grabbing the right image. Um, you might also end up deleting the wrong image uh, by accident when you want to use a specific size, but you only have the other one left. So ideally, um, if you decided not to use one of the images, you would delete it right away, so there would be less clutter on your site. But you might want to keep them both. You might have reason to use um, two images that are slightly different sizes. Um, so you could rename them with a more descriptive name. So for these two images, you could have something like uh, logo large or logo small. 
uh, or you can name them by their dimensions. This could be logo 86 by 143 and logo 101 by 170. Those are very precise names, and when you see that file name, you'll know exactly what you're looking at. Um, so to rename these items, it's really easy. You just right click and select rename, simple as that. Um, and a quick note here, uh, unrelated to spring cleaning, this is just a reminder to avoid using dashes uh, in any file names or page names in Sitecore. Uh, they will prevent the image or the page from being displayed. Uh, so if you upload a file with a dash in the name, which is really common if you get an image file from the internet or something, they might have a dash in the name. You just right click to rename the file, remove the dash, republish it, um, and you're good to go. But we aren't talking about publishing in Sitecore. Uh, next slide, please. So when we look at the images uh, in this programs folder, um, we see something like um, July matinees. So this is um, this kind of programming image is really common, um, and so is the name, the naming convention for it. Uh, if you're hosting a lot of programming, uh, you might have a big folder. Uh, full of images that look like this. You might have a folder that looks exactly like this. So you might want to add a year uh, to differentiate the file name. Uh, because in three or four years, um, are you going to remember which July this image was for? Um, and maybe it's an event that you run every year, um, something like Summer Reading Club. So in that case, uh, you could title this uh, Annual July Matinee or something to that effect. Uh, you can also number sequentially, um, like the examples that we see here. We have uh, Draw Night 2 uh, and Saturday Kids Program 2. Um, so this doesn't tell you when they were uploaded. Uh, you do know that you are seeing um, Draw Night 2. You're probably safe to delete Draw Night 1. But again, this is a less descriptive method, uh, and we can still end up in a situation like we had with Capture and Capture 2 earlier. So the more specific we are, um, the easier it will be to understand what each file is for. Uh, I also think it's important, important to note um, that a lot of this depends on how frequently you are using your website to host media. Uh, if you're not creating a lot of images for programming, um, you're not creating images to go along with events, um, you probably won't be dealing with a glut of files. Uh, filling up your website. So you might not need to have a dedicated naming convention for different file types, uh, but I will say that it doesn't hurt. Um, and if you're at a larger library and you have multiple staff uh, adding information to the website, you probably do want to think about having uh, consistent file names. You probably don't want people working off, you know, everyone working off their own standards. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So all, all the same uh, principles here, um, folder organization and naming conventions, will apply to the other side of the website, the, the content editor side of the website. Um, if you're creating a lot of events, uh, you want to remember to, to try and be consistent with your naming conventions uh, and to keep a logical folder structure. Event pages also have a tendency to, to pile up because after the event has ended, uh, and it's disappeared from the public facing site, it is still sitting in the back end uh, of the website until it's removed. So putting a date in the name uh, helps us know when events are actually in the past and are safe to be deleted. Uh, next slide, please. So this all seems like a lot of discussion about organization um, and not very much about spring cleaning, but now we come to the clean part. Um, once your files are organized uh, and labeled with dates or sequential numbers, uh, it becomes really easy to see which items are still in use uh, and which ones are out of date. So if you decided to do uh, a big spring cleaning, you could work through the files very quickly. Uh, this kind of organization might also lead you to clean as you go, uh, so things never really get messy enough to require a full spring cleaning at the end of the year. And as they say, uh, an ounce of prevention beats a pound of cure. 
So I hope uh, this gets you thinking a bit about file structure and organization for your website. Uh, and I hope these tips could help with your spring cleaning. Thank you. I thought that was great, Andrew. Um, I'm just, oh yeah, I'm just um, well, pausing the slideshow here to open the floor if anybody did have any questions. Jessica, are you seeing any questions come in? Or if anybody wants to, you know, vocally add those questions? Hello, no, no questions so far. Um, but just a reminder to all of our participants that you are more than welcome to pop questions in at any time. Um, I should have mentioned at the beginning, we are going to stop at the end of each one of our sections for questions or conversation or discussion. Um, so do feel free to pop those into the um, question box if you have them. Nothing so far though, Andrew. Probably as I thought I've got some great tips. So a lot of that <laughs> is going to, um, to seep into the digital decluttering section. So. That was a great job. Oh, and there, a question did come in. It is from Angie Trotta, and, or Angela Trotta, sorry. Uh, Angela, I'm not sure what library you're from. Um, I, I do apologize for that, but um, she wants to know, Westlock, she's from Westlock, thank you. Um, once we spring clean, will the deleted content automatically be deleted on the other end? Um, so that depends. Um, if, if the file that you're deleting is published on the website and is visible, um, it won't be removed from the website until it is the containing folder is republished in the back end. Um, you probably want to be aware of, you know, if something is on the front end of your website, you might not want to delete it until you're you're sure and you're ready, um, just in case um, that folder gets uh, republished accidentally and then the content is removed from your site. Great. Um, and Angela gives you a happy face. So um, I'll, I'll take that to mean that that answered her question. Thank you so much for that, Angela. Um, Josie chimed in and said, great job, Andrew. Um, that was in the comments. I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and again, uh, just inviting anyone to toss in a, a comment or a question whenever, whenever you need to. I think we're over to you, Steph. All right. Um... I remember how to do this. We're gonna, here we go. All right. So uh, now I'm going to be talking about digital decluttering. And this will apply to both your work and your personal digital environments. Um, and just overall tips and tricks. First, we're going to start off with why we want to do digital spring cleaning. Storage. Storage is the number one issue. And it's easy to become a digital hoarder. Uh, I'm, if I could, if you could put up hands, uh, throw in the chat or the question, like, yes, I'm a digital hoarder and I'm proud of it. Like, go ahead, there's no, there's no shame in it. It's easy to do. Um, we can accumulate masses of that. It's not our personal space. My desk, at least pointing this way, is fairly clear. Uh, my desktop may not be. Because it doesn't fill up our personal space, we don't notice it as much. So it's easy to fill up drives. It's easy to fill up views on your computer, but it's easy to ignore. But that affects your personal productivity. Many distractions. And it's also with cloud storage, really easy to do because that doesn't fill up our drives. It fills up a drive living in a data center somewhere else. But that space is still space. There's also an environmental impact. And I'll talk a little bit more of that when we get to emails, but keep in mind that files, where they live, servers, air conditioning, it all kind of impacts everything. And, and there's some great articles about there about the, um, the carbon, your carbon footprint in your, of your, your digital carbon footprint. So very interesting things. So it does impact the environment. But then as you fill up your digital spaces, much like Andrew mentioned, it can affect performance. So this can affect performance of your computer, of your devices, whatever the case. And then lastly, the more stuff you accumulate, the more there is to lose, uh, or, or worse, be a target. So just as we share, we shred paper documents that we no longer need because we don't want someone looking at that sensitive information, um, we have to make sure our digital spaces are clean for that same reason. If someone were to access 
by whatever means, legitimately or, or not, you want to take that into consideration. What is on your computer? What can people use? So let's first start with Polaris. Now, YRL performs maintenance of, of items and patrons regularly, but there is a limit to what we purge. Now, for instance, we will delete items that are withdrawn and then purge them after two years. Magazines are done at one year intervals. Now, take some time to look at your collections to see your items that are in storage. Are they really in storage? Or is that just kind of a holding place for items that you're not sure what to do with? As someone who has worked in a library, I have been guilty of that. Uh, what about mending? Do we all, you have a pile of books, a box of books tucked away on a shelf that you're going to fix the spine, you know, you meant to a year ago or two or three. So are they going to be repaired or is it better just to to thank them for their purpose and, and send them along to the recycling bin or give them to someone to mend. Look at your items in those categories. And then lost books. Lost books prevent us from, from doing patron purges. So consider looking at your collection and at, at those items that do have a status of lost and, and set a certain timeline and or value and, and just kind of go in periodically and write them off and withdraw them. That's a that's a organizational decision, but it does allow us to then, you know, clear out patrons. So the more records there are, not only does that take up space, but there is more data that is ne not necessarily needed in Polaris. Um, so unless your library does your uh, patron purging on their own, which we know that there are a number, we will purge patrons that are expired for more than two years, have less than ten dollars, ten dollars or less in fines. I have no lost items associated with it. So if there's still there's still patrons lingering around that are you know five years expired, if not longer, um, but they have you know a five dollar lost book attached to them, or they have ten dollars and fifty cents in fines. So we're we're able to help you identify those patrons. So with with the parameters that you specify, um, in order if you want to. Kind of do an amnesty and just wipe everything and purge those people because are they coming back then lastly you want to um, kind of look at your reports now this isn't exactly in polaris but on your in your file so a little bit of um, overlapping different areas but when you save a report from reports and notices to your computer it likely ends up in a folder in your documents folder called my reports some experiences may differ, but they do save to your computer. Now, once you're done with the report or you've run the wrong report, you've saved it and you've forgotten about it, clear those out, get rid of them. Um, you're more than welcome to run them again if you, you know, months down the road need them again. So keeping in mind that file that you want to get rid of. Now, simply reports, as we talk to reports, here is another place that you want to clean out regularly because for every report that you create it is saved to your environment which this environment you don't even see because it's kind of hidden in the back is lives on a server and so as these files get bigger and grow bigger they eat up our the space on our server so we regularly remind people to go in and and clean these out but this is where you do it so uh, on, the, on the slide here, you'll see under My Reports, the My Reports tab, there's a File Maintenance sub tab. And I've got a little snap of the different file types. So Ad Hoc Reports, which is kind of the list here, of which there are a lot more because I also need to regularly delete these. This is a report that you create. You go, you jump into Simpler Reports, you throw in a couple of parameters, you click Submit, you get the output, regardless of whether you download it in Excel or not, it stays here, it lives here. So it takes up space. As you can see, I've got a ginormous one. I've got little tiny ones. I've been playing, I was playing around doing some whole different holds lists and they just add up. So I go in here regularly, select all, delete. You are likely never going to need to go in here. And if you do, you probably know which one you wanna be saving. And if you do, you've probably saved it already. So 
if you need more help on on saving reports so that you can run them again without needing to fiddle around with the settings we're here to help but there are some people who are like, oh i'm not sure if i'm going to need it and that's a perfectly normal reaction but trust me you're not going to need it well okay nine times out of ten you're not going to need it and the saved reports uh will show any uh, files that are have been run as a result of a saved report so you may or may not have any in there and then the scheduled reports are the same thing so any jobs that have been scheduled if they've run they land in there as well so if you um, do have a scheduled job this is where you go and pick it up so if you run a job and you're like where does this report go to it's in this section so i highly recommend especially if you use simply reports regularly um, go in there and, and delete those reports now this next slide may i hope create some anxiety in you as you look at this uh, mess of a desktop and so now let's talk about files does your desktop look like this it's okay if it does but we can do things about it now if i was looking for something this is going to affect my productivity trying to find the particular file i'm looking for this is not organized whatsoever um, there's a million things and what's on your desktop doesn't get backed up so you want to make sure that those are in your in the network drive um, so that it does get backed up by us so if something's on your desktop and you can't find it this is just an easy thing like and also if I were doing a presentation or if I was talking to someone and had to show my desktop, there's a lot that you can see right now about my personal files. And this was me taking files out of folders to rearrange terribly on my desktop as an example. My desktop does not look like this. But the thing to remember is organization. And as Andrew mentioned, file structure organization. If for instance, you showed your screen accidentally, someone would be able to, and I have seen this, seen uh tax documents uh like my 2019 taxes uh and so that's curious if i were not a good person i might kind of log that in my brain because what's in tax documents oh well, all sorts of money money numbers your social insurance number um uh, think think about that in terms of what you have and you always want you do want as be most as possible to keep your business and personal life separate. So don't leave your personal taxes on your computer. If you were um, just wanting to print something off and it was personal, like medical forms, um, there's all sorts of personal information, um, pictures, sensitive pictures of family, whatever, like all that, just keep that separate. Uh, recommendation would be to, if you're not sure if you, Oh wait, I'll get that. So let's just talk about our computer and our desktop. Make it a regular task to kind of go in and organize your folders. Not only organize them, but delete them. And if you are one of those people who have kind of commitment issues, you're not sure whether you want to delete something, feel free to put something, create a folder on your desktop that says, however you want to label it, be like, not sure, <laughs> or, or label it with a month and a year, Put things that you're not sure that you're going to use again, much like um, when, you, when you're cleaning out your closet and you flip the hangers and after six months, if you haven't flipped the hanger, um, you know, you get rid of those clothes, same idea, put them in the folder. If you go have to go into that folder to get that file, take it out of there and then you know that you've used it. You know that you've worn that particular file. And then after a month, or two months, you can go in and then just delete that folder. And then remember to empty your recycle bin as well. Now, also do this on your phone. Um, delete any unused apps. This is a security issue because if you're not using an app, you are likely not updating an app. And there's a lot of um, security as well as privacy issues in terms of that. Permissions on apps change regularly. so. One of the things you also may want to consider is before deleting an app, if you've created an account to use that app, see if you there is an option, which many times there is, to have the provider, the developer, kind of wipe your data. 
So there are lots of game gaming apps where you can go in and request your data be uh, deleted. And so it, on their end, they will delete your data and then you can happily delete your app. That's a bit of a process. You can feel free to just delete the app because any, any unused app, especially if you're not updating it, especially if it's no longer supported, you want to get rid of that. Also clean up your images. Your images are huge file, file hogs on your phones. Um, so clean up anything. Like we all take multiple pictures, I'm sure, of different things. Some are blurry, some are good, some are offset. Just keep the one. You know, if you've got a series, keep one, and then that will definitely save space on your phone. That goes for your computer as well, especially if you have, and Andrew mentioned it in, in his presentation about the files on your website. The files on your computer, the image files particularly, don't just like upload them and forget about them. Delete the ones that are no good. You're not gonna, if you're not gonna use them in any sense, then why do you have them? Then um, keeping in mind the fi file, the folder hierarchy rather. But folder hierarchies apply to both computers and phones um, in organize organizing any documents that you've downloaded. So keep that in mind as you go. And every tip that Andrew um, went over for the folder hierarchy, the naming conventions perfectly apply to this sense as well. Now I'm going to take you into my um, soon to be patented DUO duo system of emails. And of course I'm trying to be funny. So delete or so, so unsubscribe and organize. This is how we're going to manage our emails or how I recommend you manage your emails. Emails are, there are I think two camps of people, people who like having emails with folder hierarchy structure, they sort the emails as they kind of perform the task or move them, sort them for, um, for viewing later. And then there's others who just leave them in their inbox. And you'll have thousands of emails in your inbox. And I personally can't relate to that. I don't understand how people, my mind doesn't work that way. So, but if it works for you, that's great. But make it a regular task to delete those emails. Emails that you don't need, emails that you, um, you know, are just like thank you or side conversation. So those little emails, um, they do. And every for every email, it's moving across this world. It does have that environmental impact on it. So a spam email is like, oh, I can't even remember the the CO2 output of it. It's like 0.3, and then a regular email is like one. And then an email with a photo attachment or a big attachment is, you know, 50, whatever, like whatever unit of carbon dioxide. Anyway, so make it a regular task once a week, once a day, 10 minutes here or there to go in and delete those. Again, if you have commitment issues, create that folder where you put them in. If you're not sure you're going to need it, if it's not anything important, you put it in there and then you can delete that afterwards. So first step is to clean out those emails. And don't forget about your sent email folder because there's a lot of those, um, yeah, like side conversation, what are you doing for lunch? Or thanks for this, you know, like those little things just take up space. So I um, recommend not maybe even sending them in the first place, but um, deleting them so that you clear out the space too because you don't see the space, but it is taking up space in, in the cloud on the servers, et cetera. Another way to reduce the emails that you get is to unsubscribe. So for any kind of listservs, any promotional things, unsubscribe, there is that kind of fear of missing out, uh, especially when we're talking about sales and promotions, but just go to the, if you haven't bought anything from there in a long time, just go to the, their website every now and then and visit instead of getting, um, you know, the. There are some there are some um, some stores that will send you like two emails a day, and that's crazy <laughs> because if you're you're not buying stuff twice a day, anyway, it's just like this constant bombardment. So again, thinking of that environmental impact of an email that's coming with all that sort of stuff going on, uh, think of unsubscribing as your your duty to to Mother Nature. 
You can also change preferences in many cases. So changing it if you want to get something, you know, once a week or once a day, a digest. Um, listservs will most often have that. Kind of change those in order to limit the amount of emails you get. Because it can be distracting uh, and it does take time in order to kind of sort through those. You'll and if you do, I do, I do this and I highly recommend it creating those inbox rules. So for anything that is a pro promotion or a vendor email or a listserv or a newsletter, creating that rule that it puts it into a folder if you are that type of person who likes using folders. So it automatically moves it so you can go check those when you have that, when you schedule that time. And I wanna make a mention of the emails when it comes to like newsletters. You may find yourself receiving um, newsletters or any kind of promotional thing where you're not sure how you signed up. It's like, how, did I sign up for this? Like, where did I put my name in order to, for this to, to get to me? And I get, a, I get quite a few of those, especially if you, um, you know, attended a conference or an event and you've agreed to share your email with, with vendors, you're going to be getting that. But do you know every vendor that was there? But this is also a new, um, not new, but it's been around for a while, phishing uh, attempt in order to get malware to install on your computer. They create, um, attackers will create these, these newsletters. You think they're fairly innocuous, but you're like, why am I receiving this? And then you click unsubscribe. And that is what is the, is the vector for them to get the malware onto your computer. So beware of that if you're unsure of whether you're receiving something that is um, that you didn't sign up for in the first place. In those cases, just like right click and assign it as junk and then it'll get sent into your junk mail folder so that you don't see it. And then regularly just right click on your junk mail folder to empty it and don't um, don't go in and poke around and see like, oh, what's this? <laughs> so then. So we've deleted the emails, the bulk of stuff that we don't need. So we've unsubscribed or we've filtered our newsletters and, and those other kind of high frequency emails. Let's organize what we have left. Again, using Andrew's recommendations on the fire hierarchy uh, is, is one of those things. Again, it is personal preference. I understand that if you wanna keep everything in your inbox by all means, um, but you may like folders. <laughs> anyway, again, the, the, the lessons are still the main thing, like the keeping your, you can, whether you organize them chronologically by month or by topic, by project, however you choose, organizing your folders, sorting what's in your inbox definitely can improve your your performance as well as your ability to find things quicker. And then one other last little note is in terms of that kind of environmental impact, um, as I mentioned, link to full files instead of attaching them if you can. So in many cases, you'll have, uh, you have your OneDrive or you have, you can share it if you have like a Google Drive or Google Photos, however that goes send the link instead of sending the actual file and that will actually save you a lot of space because when, and it, not to mention you're also controlling who has that, um, who has access to it. So there's also probably like multiple versions of things going around. So you may have sent me version two, but the version three is out there. I don't have an, I'm working off version two, but if we were just working off the same link, the same file, then then that would be avoided. So keep that in mind as well. That also helps. So that kind of wraps up my section. It was a whirlwind through um, digital decluttering. At the end of the day, like I like to visualize things. And when it comes to my um, digital environments, I like to visualize them as you know, if I have a 100 page PDF or if I have a 10 page PDF or whatever, I try and visualize that like sitting in my area. And so keeping that in mind, like I don't need that, goes to the, or I can find that later somewhere else, goes to the. So 
cleaning it up certainly helps your life and can reduce a little bit of stress. So I'm happy to uh, stop sharing my uh, stop sharing the screen here and uh, open it up to any questions if anyone has. Hi, Stephanie. Very, very interesting. And you know, when you you popped on that screenshot of the messy desktop, I I looked down in shame. Yes, <laughs> I I I like to think of myself as an organized person, and I do my best. But that desktop just becomes this dumping ground where I'll get to later. So I appreciate those tips, um, definitely. There are a number of questions here. Um, we'll maybe start with a question that came in from Andrew. Um, Andrew answered it um, via the, the question chat, but I thought I'd just read it out. I, it was, it's not clear to me if this was shared with everyone or not, and it was a great question and a great answer. So we'll start with that. And this came from Carla at Leduc, and this was in relation to Sitecore. She wanted to know if there was a certain amount of content allowed before we must start deleting it off of Sitecore. So I'll throw that over to you, Andrew, to just um, provide a bit of info and context for the group because it's a great question. Yeah, it is a great question. Um, so I don't know the maximum file storage um, for Sitecore. Um, I'm not sure, Stephanie, maybe if you know, um, but it is pretty substantial. Um, we've never had troubles um, storing images or files for Sitecore sites. Um, but that being said, we probably don't want to test how far it can go. Um, um, but yeah, um, we don't we don't have a, a maximum uh, number. <laughs> yeah, we. Oh, go ahead, Jessica. No, you go ahead, Steph. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the the websites are hosted on a server that lives at Parkland Regional Library. So, and but it also hosts the websites for Parkland Regional Library as well as Chinook Arch Regional Library System. So there are a lot of things in there. We have never reached, yes, as Andrew mentioned, we've never reached kind of a cap where they're contacting us to be like, you need to start deleting your stuff. But I can say from experience with our previous websites, when we hosted them on our server, we did get to that point where our, um, where we had our server, they were saying like, you're reaching them the capacity and it is affecting system performance. So it is just something good to, to keep up with so that you don't end up reaching them. And even before you reach that point, um, it is something good to think about for your own site's performance. Uh, if your own site is carrying um, a lot of images, it may be slower as a result. Those are some great, great tips. Just, just keep it tidy um, with files that you only need for the moment on your website and you, you're not going to go wrong. Um, the next question was also from Carla and it's for you, um, it's for you Stephanie. The question is, with lost or damaged items on Polaris, are there reports that list the items and costs at purge time? Our auditors ask about this. Uh, yes, so when we when we run the, so the purges, when it comes to lost or damaged items, is that we, so we don't purge anything that is lost or damaged. If it's, if anything, it's moving into a different um, status. So when it's withdrawn, like, so if you've lost something, if something has been lost and it's been uh, resolved, so someone's paid for it and then it gets withdrawn, we will delete it. But at that point, it doesn't have a lost status. Um, if, for instance, you want to delete lost items, you can, yeah, we can certainly um, recommend some lists that have that and, and reports that have that information all there. I hope that answers yeah. your question. Yeah, and I think that's a great question because our collection is, um, it's it's something that we own and that has a monetary value attached to it. So it makes sense to want to have those kinds of reports um, uh, before things are finally purged from the um, from the system. Another comment just came in. Um, Oh, and it was from Josie. She said, great job, Steph. Good points about the desktop. I feel like my best cleanup is when I have to do a webinar and share my screen. I always clean up my desktop then. I love it. That is so true, right? I, I've i cheated on that though, Josie. I, I have two screens in front of me right now. One is my laptop and it's not pretty. I'm embarrassed by it. And then the other I keep perfectly clean with a beautiful screensaver of a Jamaican beach or whatever and that's usually what people get to see when when uh, when I have to do a webinar so but those dirty little secrets that we get to hide when 
when we are, are presenting virtually. That's very funny. Are there any more questions for Stephanie or for Andrew before we move on? We'll just give um, give the audience here a couple of couple of more seconds to, to type things in. And of course, if you don't have a question right now, um, no problem. Just type them in um, as as we're speaking, and uh, we'll monitor them and do our best to answer them, but also answer them live at the end of, of each section. So um, maybe we'll just jump into the last section here. So Steph, I'll get you to just bring up that um, first slide. All right. So uh, I want to preface some of, of what I'm going to say with a few comments before I get going here. Um, the life-changing magic of spring cleaning your library spaces. So some of you may have been in my live pre-COVID workshop of the life-changing magic of tidying up your library shelves. So some of that content has been reused here um, with a, a, a bit more commentary. Um, I also want to preface all of this by saying I am going to be showing you some photos and dissecting them. None of these photos are from YRL library. So rest assured, I, I don't ever want to, you know, make anyone feel as though I'm, I'm calling their library out. Um, all of your libraries are lovely and beautiful. Um, so I had to scroll the internet for, for examples of some of the things that I wanted to talk about. So I, I did want to say that there. And I, I, I also want to preface this by saying I come at um, tidying library spaces from a very specific aesthetic. So I'm a, I'm a minimal, aside from my desktop, <laughs> I'm a minimalist by nature. Um, I've managed libraries and, and like to keep my libraries um, quite minimal. So that personal preference is going to come out in my comments for sure. And you can take that with a grain of salt. Um, I do completely understand that libraries have varying degrees of storage space that's available to them um, and politics around what um, what needs to be kept and for, for how long. And I'm not just talking about collections, right? So we'll, we'll talk about a few examples of that in, in a few minutes. So I wanted to preface all of that by, by saying, you know, take lots of my comments with a grain of salt and do know that I understand the limitations that um, many of you have in terms of size and the space available to you in your libraries. Um, one last thing, um, I, I, uh, I, I also come at this from uh, an eye of being a professional organizer. So one of my little side gigs is, is helping people organize their personal spaces. So when I look at library spaces, I definitely take that, that training and that experience into account. So wanted to talk about all of that before we hop into the next slide. I'll get you to put that on stuff. Awesome. Okay, so um, I, I want to just talk about some of the big areas that um, we need to think about when we are spring cleaning the physical space of our libraries. And, and the, the, the biggest and the most obvious one, and the one that I know all of you think about um, because you talked to us about it, is your collection and weeding your collection. So uh, I think it goes without saying that weeding your collection shouldn't just be a spring cleaning project. But of course, I wanted to talk about it here. Ideally, you're weeding your full collection every three years. Um, depending on the size of your collection, doing a great big weed is not feasible, right? You might have a big enough collection that you need to work at it um, over the course of the three years, doing it section by section, area by area, so that over the course of that three years, you have um, weeded your full library. So, um, Along with weeding can come um, some really great spring cleaning opportunities, um, shelving and blocking, which I'm um, blocking and displays, sorry, that I'm going to talk about in just a minute, but also the opportunity to actually dust and um, dust and clean your shelves. Um, it, it's, they, as you know, they can get really grubby. So weeding is a good opportunity to maybe do a little bit of that kind of work as well. Um, and, and after weeding, then of course, it's a great opportunity to conduct inventory of your collection. So um, I think of those two activities uh, together, you weed, you get rid of your, um, your dated or unused materials, and then you take an inventory of your collection to make sure that um, what's on your shelves actually matches what you're telling customers that you have in your catalog. So um, along with the weeding and the inventory is the shelf weeding that needs to happen on a regular basis in order to maintain the materials on your shelf and maintain the order of the materials on your shelf. 
shelf reading, um, again, depending on the size of the library, can be conducted in, you know, by a variety of different people in a variety of different ways. Um, in larger libraries that I've managed with larger collections, um, we break that we break that collection up into pieces so that I know over the course of a month or over the course of the three months, my entire collection was being shelf read, um, and I knew that it was in relatively good order. And again, along with shelf reading. Um, I could have staff do things like we didn't do dusting in, in uh, one of the libraries I worked in because of course there was um, uh, some contractual obligations along with that, but we could do some blocking, could do a little bit of tidying, that kind of thing, spot reading, that kind of thing. Um, so I just have some fun images up here for you. Um, I have no idea where this this I should have put provenance. I'm not a this is a bad librarian moment of this DVD collection. I've never seen anything quite like that in um, in reading that crazy but that is clearly a library and someone is clearly doing some work with the DVDs or books of their collection but the other thing um, and it got cut off in the photo is a really fantastic book um, my colleague Lena Kelly who some of you uh, know and remember she's on a mat leave right now introduced this book to me and it's become a real go-to when we are supporting libraries in thinking about reading beyond just um, on condition on condition and use so this reading handbook, I'm just going to give you the uh, full title and the name of the author. We have it as an ebook in our collection. I think a print one as well. It's really worth looking at. It's actually um, would be something that would be worth buying for your personal um, collections. It's called The Weeding Handbook, A Shelf by Shelf Guide by Rebecca uh, Vinuk, um, V-N-U-K. Um, and what this does is it provides a uh, Dewey section by Dewey section overview of how to read on content in your library. So um, once you've done your reads based on condition and on use, um, you can go through this handbook and get some great advice on how to read on content. Um, so very excellent handbook. Um, and in talking about reading on um, use and um, use and circulation, you can run reading reports in Simply Reports. Uh, we've, we've run a few seminars on that, and we consultants at YRL are more than happy to run these reports for you, where we can tell you what in your collection has circulated quite a bit. Really useful information, not only for collection development, but it will give you an idea of what books to look out for that might be um, pretty grubby um, or not looking too hot and might need replacement um, because they're used so much. And we can also run reports for you on, on what hasn't been used in a certain or specific time period. So this can be a really great starting point for a, a major read um, and, and a, a really good line by line list of materials to pull. So you as, as the librarian or the library manager doesn't have to go in and do the work and get a page to do it. You can get one of your part-time workers to do it and then review the book. So all you're really getting here is a list of books that aren't circulating, um, which then can be weeded from the collection or maybe put on display so that they can get a little bit more use. So I'm digressing a little bit from um, the actual spring cleaning piece, but uh, weeding is near and dear to my heart. I love doing it. Uh, I just think it, it keeps your collection fresh um, and it is you know it, it, it is a, a key component of, of maintaining our collection so I did want to talk a little bit more about reading and this reading handbook which uh, we use quite a bit at YRL and supporting libraries so I wanted to share that with you. Uh, next slide, slide please. Um, Steph? And I also haven't you know what I have um, my questions pane actually closed right now so um, I don't know if questions are coming in. I'll, I'll, I'll get to them at the end. That should be no problem. But please do ask questions um, all along, and, and we have time for all of that. So the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about is blocking your materials. And again, I see this happening in libraries quite naturally. What you want to aim for is having your shelves consistently at 75 to 80 percent full. And so by blocking, um, in this way, you can see a kind of a before and after picture. Um, <laughs> that before picture reminds me of what um, uh, long before public librarianship, I was a medical librarian. And this is what the, the nursing textbook shelves would look like after the first couple of weeks of the semester, just like, whoa, crazy. Um, and then the after picture there is, of, um, you know, a, a really well blocked uh, set of shelves with picture books on it. You're aiming to keep your shelves at 75 to 80% full. 
Um, and what looks good and is really pleasing to the eye um, and pleasing to your customer's eye is having that space almost equal all the way down your shelves. Now this, this is work um, and may not be the top of your priority list. So I do get that you, you might not want to get to this all the time, but being sure, but trying to block your materials and shifting your materials so that you have a pleasing look and feel just um, go so far in creating that warm, welcoming, opening, open space for your customers. Um, and, you know, certainly we've all had times where patrons and especially children have, or nursing students in my case, have gone through the collection like whirling dervishes and, and has made it look like um, the picture we have here on the right. And so just keeping an eye on those areas so that we can tidy them up, lock them again, clean them up so that uh, the shelves are ready for the next customer goes um, really far in creating that open welcome space um, that you want. If you think about your library is like the living room for your community. And what do we do with our living rooms in our home? We, we make them warm and welcoming for ourselves, for our family members, for guests that come into our home. And we do that by keeping it tidy, you know, by keeping it clean, by having, you know, beautiful things out on display. We want to do the same in our libraries. And so blocking is, is part of, of doing that. Um, Looking at my notes here, I think I'll come. I'll come to. I'll uh, come to this point here in a few minutes. If you can go to the next slide, that would be fantastic. So the next thing that I wanted to point out um, and talk to you about um, in your spring cleaning journey is assessing your customer service spaces with uh, a careful eye. Customer service desks, and again, I'm guilty of this. Um, I've worked at various customer service desks over my career in libraries. They are the worst for collecting clutter. We have pamphlets that we want our, um, our customers to have. We have notices, we have um, bookmarks sometimes that we want to give away. And all of a sudden our desk space becomes a cluttered filing cabinet. So just like those, um, you know, those, those crazy filled up screens that Steph showed us in the previous section, our customer service desk can look the same. And we, we, it's easy for us to turn a blind eye to it because we become so used to it. So one of the most beneficial things is having a third party maybe come in and assess your customer service spaces um, with a fresh eye to see where the clutter might be. So, um, you know, as I was Googling and looking for some images to, to look for this, I did see some customer service desks that were completely sparse with nothing on them. And I don't think that's realistic either, right? There are just things that we need to have out for our customers or signage that we have to have. So I think this picture that's on um, my left is a really good example of um, a happy medium where you can see there's a, a beautiful little section um, cut out in the front custom made for pamphlets, which I really like. Um, certainly not attainable by most libraries, right? That's a custom piece of millwork there, but having a special place for all of our pamphlets so that they're organized and well-maintained, um, whether it's at your desk or somewhere else in your library, it's great. The equipment there and all tidy. And the other thing I like about this picture is at the back, all of their, um, I guess, reference material or that kind of thing is just um, neatly shelved, it's tidied, it's blocked um, in a way, and uh, it just looks like a, a desk that I want to look, walk up to. Whereas the photo that's on my right of the screen, um, you can see that it's quite cluttered, um, covered in signs. Um, this I pulled right from the main page of uh, a public library in the state. So I didn't want to incriminate that library and put the name of it there, but this is this is the public image. This is the image they're putting out to the public who are either visiting them virtually or visiting them, and it's cluttered. And then you look at the shelves behind. Um, you can see that they're uh, a little bit of display. You can see some photos. You can see that they're using it for storage. Um, and all that's fine. There's lots of things that we have to store at our, our customer service or reference desks, but taking a few minutes to make sure that it looks neat and tidy is really important in terms of creating that warm, open, welcome space that we want our customers to have and, and, and feel, I guess, when uh, they walk into our library. Um, one of the things that I would say about shelves behind desks is um, we have to be really careful that they don't become too cluttered. In our digital world, it's easier and easier for us to not have to rely on print materials, so print reference materials. These used to be places where we would store um, uh, 
subject heading guides um, back in the day when we had to look up our subject headings um, uh, in print. We have so our dictionaries, our encyclopedias, other reference materials. We need these sorts of items less and less because we have access to them digitally through um, our databases that we subscribe to. And so think about what you really need behind that desk and think about how you might be able to turn some of that space into display to um, to, um, to to interest your customers. So um, I promised I wouldn't name names, but uh, I did walk one of the last libraries that I was able to visit in person in YRL, made use of their shelves um, behind their desk to display some antique textbooks that I think that had come from maybe a local school or something. And I thought it was a really interesting and beautiful use of the space because um, it was local ephemera, uh, it was it inspired conversation by the customers, and it filled up that space in a really um, tidy and decorative way. So think, think about those shelves behind your desk and um, what they're saying to your customers when, when you walk in. All right, uh, next slide please Stephanie and we're going to talk here a little bit about displaying material this is something a little bit different than blocking blocking is just making sure that your books are straight and tidy on the shelf and that you have some even lines um, but sometimes you don't have enough books or you have too many books um, to, to to block appropriately and so again I see this in a lot really excellent displays in lots of libraries that that idea of turning books forward um, to fill up shelf space uh, maybe after you've done a weed or lots of materials are out um, you can overdo it um, definitely uh, you know you don't want to fill up all of your spaces it's really nice for your customers and for you and your staff to have some clean open spaces to rest your eyes on right so if you look at that um, that photo on my uh, left, um, they've done a really good job of facing some picture books forward. But what I'm really grateful about is that it doesn't look as though that they've all that they've covered the top of that shelf with with picture books as well. Um, you know, it can look really cluttered, and and more importantly, what that what covering the tops of those shelves can do in some libraries, not all, is it can um, mar your um, your lines of vision across the library and it, it can you know it's a security issue when you can no longer see right across the library so think about um you know yes you want to put your books on display and face the forward to interest your customers but don't overdo it and then in the example on the right here this is an example of a library that has had multiple copies of one book and they need to get those things circulated and what they've done is they've taken those multiple copies and they've faced a series of them um, forward so that customers can see them, they can grab them, they can get those extra copies of the, of the title circulating again and off the shelf so that they're not taking up too much space. So um, this, just thinking about um, on your shelves and blocking first and then display because there's some really creative things that you can do there. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, Steph. All right. Um, the next bugaboo for so many libraries is what to do about book sale materials. This is really tricky. Um, it can be a headache for so many of you, especially in spaces that don't have a lot of storage. But here's the catch. Book sales are huge money makers. So um, huge money makers and just a wonderful way to get rid of materials that you've maybe weeded from your collection that are no longer useful or relevant to your collection but still may be of interest to others as well as all of those donations. Um, so a, a couple of thoughts here with book sale materials and again this is where you need to take things with sort of a grain of salt and think about your own situation and the own you know the space that you actually have. I do get that um, lots of libraries just don't have a lot of place to store these, but um, consider not um, having an ongoing book sale in your library. And so by that, I mean um, having a, a space dedicated solely to book sale materials 365 days a year. Um, Having that can do a couple of things. Your customers will start overlooking it, except those really keen ones, I suppose. They can start overlooking it um, and forgetting about that it's there, so you're not generating anticipation or excitement for the book sale. Um, it's just always there. And it could be taking up space that would be better used for um, customer use, whether it's displaying of your own library collection or even, you know, even more importantly, um, 
a space for your customers to relax and sit a table, a chair, that kind of thing. So if you have a space to store your books and materials off the floor, um, I highly recommend it. And that way you can build up at the anticipation for your book sale four or six times a year. And when you bring those things out, you're making a ton of cash. The other thing that I would say is you, if you haven't already, um, make sure that you have created some really clear donation guidelines for your materials. So, um, you know, I, I know that that many people like to use libraries as, as dumping grounds for, um, you know, their old sets of encyclopedias or old magazines. National Geographic is, is the joke, right? Um, but consider making um, making your expectations around donations really clear so that you and your staff can refuse refuse things that don't meet that criteria and and that you know aren't going to sell um and, and make you money which is the ultimate goal of a book sale right so um uh, for those of you who don't have the storage space to store your book sale materials off set up off the, the main or public floor or other public spaces um, talk to your board or ask around town there, there might be storage opportunities or spaces elsewhere that you can um, you know, that you can find to store the boxes of your goodies so that when it comes time for the book sale, you can have your friends or your volunteers pull those things out and put the book sales up. Um, and you're not taking up valuable floor space 365 days a year for your book sales. All right, uh, next slide, step. Signage and wayfinding. So your ultimate goal with signage and wayfinding is is to make your customer feel smart. You want your customer to be able to navigate their way through your space and through the collection um, with minimal kind of interaction from you or your staff. It's gonna make them feel good about um, how they use the library. It's going to, um, uh, and it's going to just reduce a lot, of, hopefully reduce a lot of those directional questions that you may not have time. So um, the sample on the, uh, on my left hand side of the screen with the Dewey numbers is um, a, a favorite photo of mine. And again, I see these in lots of the Lyra libraries that I visit. And these are just simply um, uh, paper holders that have been adhered to the edge of the shelf so that you can put in your Dewey numbers that are down the shelf. And the reason that you don't have those um, as uh, kind of um, permanent fixtures there with permanent marking is so that when you do shift your collection or you do do a little bit of locking, it's very simple and easy for your staff to use a template to print off new Dewey numbers so that you can direct, uh, so that you have an accurate overview of what's actually down that shelf. The sample on the right is um, an example of maybe what not to do in a library and that's just put posters here, there and everywhere. It, we, we think we're doing a favor um, to our customers by um, putting up information about activities that we're, that you're doing in your community in places like this. So sides of shelves I see and fronts of reference desks I see. But what you're really doing is adding to the visual clutter. So one of the things you could consider, because I'm not saying that these things are not necessary or needed, they are, right? We all love going to the community bulletin board at our local grocery store or um, even in the library. But consider just that, a community bulletin board where you can display information like this all in one place so that people can see it, um, you know, go through all of the information and it's all in one place instead of scattered throughout the library. So just something to think about um, in terms of, you know, that not adding to the visual clutter with, with too many posters, and not just posters of community events, but also posters of um, new books that are coming out or some of those freebies that we get from publishers. Um, they're beautiful. With, uh, Believe me, I've seen them. Some of them are just beautiful when you when you open up those packages from the publishers, but you get too many of them on your wall and, and it just becomes overwhelming to your customers. Um, next slide, please, Steph. Awesome. So the next thing that I want to talk to you about is displaying decor in your library. So I touched on this um, really briefly. Um, we can we can get, uh, we can go really overboard with the amount of decor in our library. Um, there's so many beautiful things that either get given to us or that we've collected over the years. And, 
and there's um just like a decluttering or discarding things in our home there's that guilt factor that's associated with decluttering decor items in the library as well i'll give you a really good example um, prior to public libraries i, I mentioned i worked at McEwen university and um Every year at McEwen University, we celebrate McEwen Day. And I, I, want, I think it might be on Grant McEwen's birthday, but we celebrate our namesake. And the McEwen Library, at some point, some staff member in the you know, mid 80s made a life size paper mache doll of Grant McEwen. Let me tell you, by the time I came to that library in the early 2000s, that thing was dusty and stinky and ripped up and nobody wanted to discard it because someone had made it with love and donated it to the library. Um, eventually it had to go. I think its arms just sort of fell off or whatever, but um, we, we come to these situations where someone has created something beautiful for the library, they've donated it, and, oh, and it doesn't fit our space anymore, or it's, out of, it's outdated, or it's, um, you know, a, a whole variety of reasons. So think deeply about the decor that you're displaying. So this picture here, um, this is a pretty typical, you know, a pretty typical library. And I think there's some really good and not so good things about this picture. So you can see um, display decor all along the top black shelf. Um, I mean, it's neatly spaced. It's, it's interest. It could be interesting. And if it's, you know, local ephemera, you know, maybe, maybe there's a rationale for it to be, be there. But um, my head, my mind first goes to, oh my gosh, my vision lines are already so um, marred by a high shelf. I don't want anything more on it, plus the dusting. Um, but what I do like are the use of the bins at the bottom. And I see this a lot in libraries to hold things like um, board books or easy readers. It, the matching bins with the matching colors just is so pleasing to the eye. And you can see what they've done here is they've matched the color of the bins to the color of the um, uh, stools and the coffee table and I just think it all looks really good and cohesive that way. Um, along the back there you can see an example of books on display. There's a lot of books on display there but they're not marring sight lines in any way so you know it, it's okay. So there's some good and some not so great things about here but um, I just uh, just like having someone come in with a, a fresh eye to look at your reference desk and that clutter on your reference or your customer service desk, you might want to do the same with the decor in your library because some, it might be time for some of it to go and you just can't see that because you've been around it for so long or you know the history behind it like our McEwen, our paper mache grant McEwen and nobody wants to discard it because we know the person who's made it and they made it with love and it's been a part of our history for so long until it's thankfully that thing's arms fell off and, and we were done with it. So um, that would be uh, uh, just some advice and some thoughts about decor. And the next slide, please, Steph. Yeah. So the last thing that I want to talk to you about is, um, I, I use the heading here of movement and flexibility. Um, but what I think I'm getting at here is something a little bit deeper in that. When you are able to um, weed your collection um, remove a lot of, you know, remove a lot of uh, extra items that are no longer needed. You all of a sudden have all of this open space that you can use for programming and for customers to relax and um, just use the space and be in the space. And these were some wonderful before and after pictures that I found in some articles on decluttering libraries. Um, uh, the, the one on my left is a public library um, who was able to, they were able to do a weeding project and, and relocate some of their uh, computers so that they could turn this, this space into a creation and a maker space, um, which I thought was just phenomenal. And you can see that they, they clearly did it on a very minimal budget, which I really appreciate. Um, it looks like just a, a fresh coat of paint and some rearranging of furniture when they were able to um, just make, there, there's a Lego wall and there's a whiteboard wall and just make a really active animated space for people just by doing some decluttering and clearly some weeding. Uh, the picture on my right is a little bit more formal and you can see that there probably was a bit more money put into this, but this is uh, clearly an academic library. Um, but I wanted to share this with you anyway, uh, because this was an academic library that and followed the trend about 10, 15 years ago to significantly reduce the size of their reference collection 
so that they could um, have more space for their students to just lounge and relax and study and think of the library as space. So you can see in the top picture, um, those shelves are already empty. They've clearly um, cleaned out their reference section already. Um, I was a part of a similar project um, at a university where, um, you know, really big push to purchase reference materials, high quality reference materials online, um, so students could use those and then turn the reference space, what was left of the reference space into this wonderful sort of, um, we put booths in similar to uh, a booth that you would see at a restaurant for students to use and study at and, and relax. And it was just a really phenomenal use of space. Um, the reason that I wanted to share this with you is because it's possible that in, in your library you're still holding on to items, um, maybe for the same reason you're holding on to old decor items, that could be removed from your collection um, in order to create, free up and create more space. So um, if you're still if you're holding on to older encyclopedia sets, um, uh, know that we have a, a wonderful um, you know, Britannica and World Book and all those encyclopedia sets as electronic resources. Um, and so you can free up space if that's what you need. Or um, national, you know, magazine collections, I say National Geographic again, but you might have old magazine collections or old textbook collections or just some local ephemera that could be cleaned up. Um, even libraries that are still collecting those local history books. So I think you know what I'm talking about, those local history books that were just um, wonderful tributes to um, settlers in a particular town. And it was very popular to pull those things together in the um, early and mid 80s. And we still have many of those. Um, they might be political to get rid of. Um, it would be something you'd want to talk about with your staff and with your board. Um, but do know that um, that at uh, in the early 2000s, these are all digitized by the University of Calgary. And I, I'm a, I have a genealogy as one of my hobbies and I make use of these local history books quite a bit to study my own family's genealogy We've been in the Prairie provinces um, for, for several generations. And so I use these quite a bit, but I don't seek out the print version of them anymore. Um, I use the University of Calgary portal and do keyword searches for the names or the towns or the locations that I'm looking for. So there's ways that, um, that you might be able to still make materials available to your customers without having to have those physical materials right there. Um, that's freeing up quite a bit of space. So just some, just some, some ideas and some concepts for you to think about. So that ends sort of my 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 rant or my talk on on your library space and just giving you some ideas about what um, what you might want to tackle with your spring cleaning this year. Maybe I will turn the floor over to questions. And I have a slide here for your spring cleaning goals. So um, if you don't have questions, um, feel free to share uh, what what you think might you might want to tackle, whether it be. Um, digital or on your website or um, in your physical space. I, I, I don't see any questions. I, I either um, bored you all or made you all bored or covered everything, covered everything. I don't know. I'm, I'm watching. I'm watching the questions here with bated breath, you guys. Someone needs to throw something to me. Oh, thank you, Angela. You did amazing coverage of all the items. Well, I we appreciate that, Angela. Um, yes, it's coverage, and it's also it's just it's inspiration, right? Um, we all have our own priorities um, for what we need to maintain and clean up in our libraries and our own schedules for it too. So. Um, hopefully we just gave you some fresh ideas um, for how to approach the, the maintenance piece of the work that we do every day. So thank you for that comment, Angela. And uh, Patty, um, who is, Patty, I know you and I can see your face. You're at Hinton, right? Um, it was just perfect. We're act actually actively doing some of these things now. Patty, I'm curious, what is it that you guys are working on there? waiting for a comment here if she can hear me. Oh, weeding and blocking and cleaning. Yeah. Feels good to do some of that stuff. You know, and it feels good. Oh, Beaumont. Patty, of course. I, I do apologize. Um, 
And yes, I can see your face in my head, but I got the I got the library wrong. Yeah, weeding and blocking and cleaning. It's a good time to do it with the library being closed. Um, and it just freshens up the space for when we get when we're opened up again. Um, uh, definitely. All right, Angie says, thanks all, great info and things to think about. All right, well, you guys know how to get a hold of us if you have questions about any of this. Um, um, our ge general email is askyrl at yrl.ab.ca, um, and we're here to support you with any of this. Um, Caitlin, uh, Caitlin here, Caitlin Watts says, everything sounded great. Definitely want to focus on this physical space and blocking for sure. I've done the virtual cleanup and now time for the stuff between the four walls. And Caitlin, I've, I've been out to Breton and I know that you've been working really hard at, at uh, making some changes in your spaces. So um, yeah, I, I'm excited to see what, what, what else you can come up with for sure. Um, if any of you need a fresh eye to look at your virtual or your physical spaces, um, definitely give us a call. Uh, we're not quite into doing on-site visits yet unless there's an emergency and of, of course we will. Um, but it won't be long. Um, vaccinations are happening and libraries are opening up and we are raring to hop into our YRL Subarus and get out on the road to visit you guys again. So um, uh, any little job is a good excuse for us to get out here in the next couple of months. So if, if one of those things is having someone come and look at your at your spaces and make some suggestions about um, how to move things or fix things up, we're there for you. All right, I think with that, um, we will sign off. Um, so on behalf of Stephanie and Andrew, it was just such a pleasure to spend this time here with you today. And um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care, everyone. Bye.